But before I move forward, I want to clarify something. Um, last week, I know, was uh, kind of a shocker week. I know it, it caused a little bit of a stir, so I want to um, want to clarify just a couple things. I know I spent my entire time last week basically telling you that you cannot earn your way into salvation. You cannot earn your way into eternity. Hopefully, I made that abundantly clear. Um, but then I said... It takes effort, effort that we have to put in. And I gave you Luke uh, chapter 13, verse 24, and it says, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I say to you, will seek to enter and will not be able. And that word strive, we said it means to contend for a prize or to struggle or to work at something, to fight for something, to compete in a competition. And so it it almost looked like I, I said two different things and they kind of contradicted each other that you cannot earn your way into heaven but that we have to strive to work for um, our way through the narrow gate so which is it that's a big question right which is it now hopefully i answered this hopefully you got it but in case there is um, any misconception about what i said i want to bring a couple of verses here Um, philippians chapter 2 verse 12 And here's Paul speaking to this church, and he says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, and then here it is, here he says it, continue to work, and then what's that next word? Out. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Now, what word is not in there? It says, continue to work out your salvation. I'll give you a hint. It's a conjunction. You guys, you remember your conjunctions from English class and but or nor for yet? Anybody else remember that? I don't know why I remember those stupid things, okay? But I remember random things like that, but I can't remember what I'm looking for in the refrigerator when I open the door, okay? But there's a very important conjunction that is not in there. And I think, Harasa, you said it. What's it? For. It does not say continue to work for your salvation. It says continue to work out your salvation. This demonstration of the salvation, of the saving grace that Jesus brought as he hung on the cross. There is a huge difference there. And I wrote this down. I said this last week, but I really wanted us to get this before we move on. That salvation happens in an instant. Okay, we decide in a moment to give our lives to Christ. Now, some of us, we've had this process. Some of us that we can remember. Man, there was like, I remember the time where I gave my life to Jesus. Okay, but I believe that salvation happens in an instant. When your name is written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. But sanctification, and remember we said sanctification was that process of becoming more and more and more like Jesus. And we'll never arrive to that point, but that's the challenge. That's the calling to be salt, to be light, to look like Jesus in this world. So sanctification, which is the result and the evidence of true salvation, happens for the rest of your life. And so there's a huge difference there. We don't work for our salvation, but we work out our salvation through a process of sanctification, through realizing, oh my goodness, God sent Jesus, his son, to die for me. And if it was only me on this earth, he still would have done so. And he loves me that much. No way. No way. I'm going to give my life to him because he did that for me. And I want to talk one more about one more thing quickly about grace. And it's not referred to in this passage, especially towards the end here in Matthew chapter 7, but the definition of grace is getting what you don't deserve. You ever gotten anything that you don't deserve? I've gotten a lot of things in my life that I don't deserve. And that's what grace is. Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. See, that's bad news. That verse is really, really bad news because righteousness is God's standard for salvation and eternity with him. 
And if it says there's none righteous, no, not one, not one person is righteous, and righteousness is God's standard for salvation, again, really bad news for us. And that's where grace comes in. Romans 5, 8, my favorite verse ever since I was a kid before I can remember. <clears throat> but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, and here it is. While we were still sinners, while we had our backs turned to God, while we were choosing to live against him, Christ died for us. That's grace. That is amazing, unfathomable grace. And that's what compels us to live a life of sanctification. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. You didn't do it, okay? It's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. That's why we were created, to do good works, to look different from the rest of the world as a result of our salvation, as a result of that grace, which God prepared in advance for us to do. It's by grace and grace alone that you have been saved through faith, believing what Jesus Christ did for us, believing in God's perfect sacrifice of his son Jesus. That is grace. It's getting what you don't deserve. You don't deserve it, you can't earn it, you don't need to earn it, but you will be changed because of grace. Grace changes lives. Now, this is important to understand. I'm not purposely trying to get anyone to doubt your salvation. That is not my point and that's not my motivation for this. I am, however, I'm trying to get all of us to follow uh, Paul's command in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse five, and it says this. It says, examine yourselves to see whether you were in the faith. Test yourselves. Now, realize Paul is writing this letter to the church in Corinth. He's writing it to a church. He's writing it to a bunch of believers. And he's saying, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test. So it's like there's this test, or another way to say it, that we've been saying it all along, is there is evidence of true salvation. I don't believe the Bible says, hey, you know, go to one service, uh, hear this feel-good message, pray this prayer, and then go back to your regular life and never do anything, and you're good and you're saved. I do not believe that is what Scripture says. Because there are so many times in here, and we're going to cover it next week. Last week was a little bit tough to swallow. Today, kind of, we're going to talk about a little bit of a different category. Next week, you may just want to stay home. I'll just, I'll just put it that way, okay? When the preacher warns you, you may want to stay home, you know it's going to be a zinger. But it's, I promise you it's going to be truthful. And it's going to be helpful in a way that we will not fail the test. Again, not having to work for our salvation works, they don't matter. The Bible has a lot to say about what our good works actually look like as compared to God's righteousness. They're like filthy rags. It's disgusting. But it's the evidence of our salvation. So here we go. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. I had to get that out of the way. A little bit of setup for this week and next week. Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. Here we go. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. That's that thing that we're talking about. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree or diseased tree, some translations say, cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Again, it's another way to say there's going to be evidence 
of a true follower of Jesus. Your life will stand out from the rest of the world. So I'll just throw it out there right now. Does your life stand out from the rest of the world? Because scripture has a lot to say about it. So here we go. The title of my message today is A Wolf in Sheep's Clothing. We've all heard this expression, right? And it comes from uh, verse 15. It says, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. Now, I believe that mostly what Jesus was referring to was the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. Because the Pharisees were taking the Jewish law and they were twisting it in a way that it was all about outward appearance. That's those things that you're doing. That's that earn your way. That's your, your good enough category. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Don't follow them. They're false prophets. They're false teachers. They're teaching a gospel that I never intended. Watch out for them. And a prophet is, of course, one who speaks on God's behalf. It's one who says, hey, I, I heard from God, or, uh, or you could have a false teacher. It's one that would, person like myself, a teacher of God's word. And you could have people that are falsely teaching God's word, and it sounds a lot like what comes out of the Bible, but there's just a few things that are a little bit different that throw it all off. <clears throat> and followers of Jesus, of course, are commonly called sheep throughout all of scripture, right? And that's why Jesus is the good shepherd. <laughs> Excuse me. So we're referred to as sheep. Now, sheep aren't always the smartest of creatures, are they? The Bible has a lot to say about sheep. And um, did, did you know um, what the sheep said when he was told of Jesus' birth by the angel? He says, Hallelujah. You know what the sheep said when he was told of the death of Steve Jobs? I heard. You'll get it later. Who was the most violent sheep of all time? Rambo. Rambo. Did you know that there's a whole Facebook group for sheep jokes? I didn't join, okay? Don't judge me. I didn't join, but I do have one more. This one's my favorite. What is a young sheep's dream car? I heard it. A Lamborghini. Yes. Which, oddly enough, is my dream car. So if anybody wins the lottery, and I know we're Christians aren't supposed to play the lottery, but if you do, and you need to just dispose of some of that income... I, I, do, I would love a Lamborghini. Um, here's the problem with sheep, though. There's a lot of people, kind of referring back to us now, as Christians, as followers of Jesus. There's a lot of people that they look, and they act, and they talk, and they even smell like sheep. Do you know that shepherds actually pick up the scent of their herd of sheep, and that's one of the ways that sheep know them. And there's some people, man, and they look and they talk and they speak that Christianese and they act like and they smell like sheep, but you know what? They're just a wolf in sheep's clothing. And Deuteronomy has a lot to talk about it. Chapter 13 and then Deuteronomy 18 says, if you have a false prophet a false teacher who is even performing signs and wonders and doing all this stuff, but makes one false prophecy. That's it. They are not of God. And you know what it says to do to them? Put them to death. One, just one. But everything else they got right, but just one, it says, they are not from God. And, and, and in chapter 13 in Deuteronomy, it says, if a false prophet arises from one of you, who is he speaking to? He's speaking to Israel. He's saying they come right from among you. So false prophets, these wolves in sheep's clothing are very, very difficult to spot. So we're going to walk through how it is that we spot false prophets, false teachers, 
false teaching. That's what we're going to look at today. So um, do you think that this is a problem today, though? You think that there's false prophets and teachers out there today? Here's a few. Um, maybe you see them on TV. Now, I'm not saying every preacher on TV is a false prophet. I'm not saying that, but I know there's a lot of them. Um, they write a lot of books. I guarantee you that some of you guys have some of their books. Um, they come and knock on your door, usually early on a Saturday morning, you know, short sleeve, button up shirt with a tie. Speaking of that, let's, let's dive into that for a second here. So the, talking about the Jehovah's Witness here, 1906, Russell, the founder, the first uh, Jehovah's Witness president said this, these truths I present as God's mouthpiece. I admit to being the faithful and wise servant foretold in Matthew 24, and that was printed in the Watchtower, which is their publication, and it's basically, it's just as good as the Bible, if not better. Now, he's saying, I am God's mouthpiece, okay? I'm that faithful and wise servant that Matthew 24 talks about. It's kind of interesting. You know what else Matthew 24 talks about? False prophets and teachers. It's interesting that he's quoting that. Here's another one. This one is in 1913. Some have a strong desire to worship God. Others have a weak desire and others have no desire at all. The difference is due to the shape of the brain. What? Okay. Here's another one. 1966. 6,000 years from man's creation will end in 1975. And the seventh period of a thousand years of human history will begin in the fall of 1975 CE. Which, that one's really interesting to me. You want to know why? Because I was born in the fall of 1975, October 5th to be exact. And I, I don't know, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I'm still here. Okay, so false prophecy? Yeah. And these are just a few. There's many, many, many. And this whole religion... This whole quote-unquote faith is founded upon these false teachings and false prophecies. Here's another one. You guys heard of Benny Hinn? Benny Hinn, he's known for his healing. Okay, and he would actually stage people, bring them up on stage with this ailment and heal them right there. Do you know that Benny Hinn claimed that the Lord was going to appear in bodily form on stage with him at one of his crusades? Guess what? It didn't happen. Duh. But how many hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, follow this guy, give to this guy? Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, or the Mormon Church, he says this, The coming of the Lord, which is nigh, even 56 years, should wind up the scene. Now, I'm not great at math, but that was said February 14, 1835. I'm pretty sure there's been 56 years since February 4th, 1835, correct? Am I, am I right on my math there? I think so. Did the coming of the Lord happen? Nope. Here's another one. U.S. government would be overthrown, quote unquote, in a few years, May 18th, 1843. And this was contingent on the U.S. government bowing down to the Mormon church and uh, seceding to some of their demands. Didn't happen. Guess what? U.S. government's still going. False prophecies, false teachings, and again, millions of people are following this quote-unquote religion. Because it says a lot about Jesus and it kind of goes from the Bible and if you don't know, then they will slide it right in. And you'll never know. And next thing you know, you're following a false prophet or a false teaching. So there's no shortage of false prophets and teachers, but they're very hard to spot. So how does that apply to us now? Like, what, what do we need to do about it? So here you go. Beware of... People that do a lot of, quote-unquote, Jesus talking, but that are preaching a different gospel. Beware of something that claims to be a new revelation. That's another big sign of it. Beware of something that claims to be extra-biblical. 
Like I've heard people say, man, I was reading in the Gospel of Thomas, and like it says that Jesus was married. Uh, what? Well, uh, no. No, first off, it's false. Second off, it's not part of the canon, which was the original Bible that was put together. And third off, it was written hundreds of years after the life of Jesus. It's false. Don't believe those things. Nothing extra biblical. Beware of anything that advances secondary doctrine ahead of or equal to primary doctrine. I know some people that, man, they take just different secondary doctrines, things that, hey, are important, they're in God's word, but we don't need to split hairs on them, and they're putting them just as important as primary doctrine, like saved by grace through faith, the virgin birth, the trinity, things like that. You cannot advance secondary doctrine over that. Beware of anything that takes authority, power, or divinity away from Jesus. And again, yes to pick on them again. Jehovah's Witness and Mormons both believe in Jesus as well as Islam believes there was a Jesus, but they're taking away authority and power from him. They still say he was important, but anytime you take away power and authority and divinity from Jesus Christ, you lose everything. It's false teaching. So, how do we spot a wolf in sheep's clothing? Verse 16, Matthew chapter 7. By their fruit, you will recognize them. By their actions, by their consistent actions. And man, they, they probably smile a whole lot. And, and, and they're really nice. But their actual fruit is the way that Jesus says you're going to recognize them. And then he kind of goes on into this example. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? And the answer is no, of course you don't. You don't get grapes from thorn bushes. You get grapes from grapevines. Everybody knows that. Galatians 5.22, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, is love. That's a, that one right there is a big one. You could stand alone on that, but it says it's love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. Those are the things that we see evident in a life of a follower of Jesus. And what do they do? They always point to Jesus. It's not me. It is all Jesus because I know who I am. And I would not be who I am today without Jesus. Just keep pointing the credit back to Jesus. Verse 17. Likewise, Jesus goes on, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree, or like I said earlier, a diseased tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And then this one's pretty scary. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. It says, if, if you're this false prophet or if you're not bearing good fruit, what does Jesus say? What happens to those branches that aren't producing? Oh, they're cut off and they're thrown into a fire. Now, I don't know about you, but to me, that doesn't sound very good, does it? That doesn't sound like eternal life with Jesus Christ. So here we go. Here's what we're going to do with the rest of our time. We're going to look at six ways to recognize false prophets and teachers. Six ways. So let me ask you this question before we dig into this. What must we do to be able to identify false teaching? What? I'll, I'll make it really easy for you. What must we know inside and out to the best of our ability to be able to spot false teaching and preaching? It's this thing right here. So I'll ask you, I'll take this opportunity again. Are you digging into God's word? Because if you're not, guess what? Saturday morning, it's coming. On TV, it's coming. The new book's coming out. It's coming. And you will be deceived if you don't know what God's word says. 2 Timothy 2.15 It 
It says, do your best, or some translations say, be diligent or study to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Do your best. Study. Get in this book. Read it. Do devotions. Look at commentary. See what it has to say. Because B-I-B-L-E, you know what it stands for? Basic construction before leaving earth. This is a roadmap to the best life that you could possibly have. A life that is blessed by God in every single way. Are things still going to be difficult at times? Absolutely. God does not promise to take away all of our problems. God promises to walk with us through those problems in life. Six ways to recognize false prophets and teachers. Number one, false prophets and teachers love to preach the prosperity gospel. You guys heard of this, this phrase, the prosperity gospel? It's all over. It's very, very popular now. It's the, you know, follow Jesus and he's going to make all of your problems go away, right? It's this life filled with unicorns and roses and hearts and rainbows and everything is just going to be okay if you have enough faith. And if you sow into my ministry, which means if you call this number and you have, we take debit and credit cards, okay, and there's a lot of that. But if you have enough faith and you sow into our ministry, then God's going to replace it tenfold. God's going to make everything better in your life. Does God make things better? Absolutely. But again, he doesn't take away our problems. He guides us through them. He allows us to go through them so that we learn and we don't make those mistakes again. Because he knows what's best for us. Matthew 6, 21, talking about the prosperity gospel, it says, for your, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If that's what you're all about, treasure, man, that's where your heart's going to be. It's not going to be after God. And verse 24, you cannot serve both God and money. That was in the previous chapter to this. And Jesus is just setting this up, saying, hey, if that's your main concern, prosperity, stuff good happening to you, that's going to be your God. I can't be your God if that's your God. So number one, false prophets and teachers love to preach the prosperity gospel. Number two, false prophets and teachers do more talking and tickling of the ears than teaching and preaching of the word of God. Second Timothy chapter four, verses three and four say this, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. That means they won't like to hear the hard stuff. They want the easy prosperity gospel preaching. But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. It's basically a big way to say, hey, you know what? There's a lot of people and they just want their ears to be tickled. They don't want to hear the hard stuff in the Bible. They just want to hear the smooth, easy, God is love. All roads lead to heaven. It's okay. You can go out and live your life however you want to and make whatever choices. And, you know, you said this little prayer at one time, but nothing in your life changed. Or, you know, ah, it's okay. It's all going to work out at the end. And it says people are going to leave teachers and churches that are preaching, hard preaching like this, and they're going to go find somebody that's going to tickle their ears. Be careful of seeking after the new thing like we talked about earlier, prophecy fulfilled or the missing puzzle piece of scripture or a new translation, explanation or opinion of scripture. Be careful of what you're searching for. Now, should we read devotions? Yes. Should we read commentary? Yes. Should we do Bible studies? Yes. But be careful where we take that because a lot of the times we go searching for something else that's not there and, and basically that we just don't need. Everything that we need is right here in this. Number three, false prophets and teachers refuse to call out sin. This is a big one. So in addition to the prosperity gospel, there's this lack of calling out sin all the way to a full-blown acceptance of sin. 
And I'll tell you, there are churches in this area that have a full-blown acceptance of sin. Uh, things that are very specific in God's word. And they're very accepting. Because you know why? Because God is love. Yes, he is. But God is also truth and God is justice. And, and God never bends what he said. What he said is what he said. It is truth. Galatians 6.1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, that's a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. It says, hey, listen, if a brother or sister, you see that they're not walking in the right way, if, if they're living in sin, you, you need to be careful, but go to them and explain about what they're doing. Now, guess what? That ain't easy. That's a really, really tough thing to do. But Paul is telling us in Galatians to do that. Now, let's take that a step further. Listen to this. Ezekiel chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. It says, if I say to the wicked, this is Ezekiel prophesying on God's behalf. If I say to the wicked, you shall surely die. And you give him no warning nor speak to warn the wicked from his wicked way in order to save his life. That wicked person shall die for his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. What's that saying? That's saying, hey, listen, if somebody is in iniquity, in sin, in transgression, and you're not calling it out, and it's so bad that, man, I, I, I curse him and he dies for that or, or he is liable for that. Guess what? His blood is on your hands. That's how serious calling out sin is. It goes on, it says, but, it's good news here, if you warn the wicked and he does not turn from his wickedness or from his wicked way, he shall surely die for his iniquity but you will have delivered your soul. God's saying, hey, you did what you were supposed to do. You can't help them. You tried. But their blood's not going to be on your hands. So not calling out sin, not okay. False prophets, false teachers, they refuse to call out sin. Number four, false prophets and teachers don't believe in hell or the need for repentance. This is kind of a popular thing, right? Recently, a handful of years ago, there was a guy that made a lot of awesome videos about faith and Christianity and all this stuff. And then just out of the clear blue, at least to me, out of the clear blue, he comes out and says, yeah, I don't really believe in that hell thing. What? How, how do you read this and not believe in hell? You know why? Because it's not convenient to believe in hell. Because that means that you have to straighten up your life because if not, if you don't get rid of your sin, if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're not going to go to heaven. There's another place to go. And if you just, oh, I'm just going to eliminate that out of my mind, boy, that's real convenient. But it doesn't work. So false prophets and teachers don't believe in hell or the need for repentance. And repentance, that word, we talk about it a lot. It means to change one's mind. To, to turn from what you're doing, to, to realize that your sin is so disgusting that you're not just, oh, I'm sorry for my sin, but like, I'm changing my mind. I'm not going to do that thing anymore. And that's repentance. That's changing your life in a way that it's leaving the past behind and becoming a new creation, as Paul says. And false prophets, they teach to be sorry for your sin, but not to hate it. We need to hate our sin. Oh, hate's a strong word. You're right. We need to hate our sin. Acts 3.19, it says, Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out, that times of refreshing may come from the Lord. And Matthew 3.8 says, Produce fruit, there's our word again, how, how do we produce fruit? In keeping with repentance. Changing our mind from the old ways, from our old self. 
and living as a new creation. So number four, false prophets and teachers don't believe in hell or the need for repentance. Number five, false prophets and teachers don't believe Jesus is the only way. <laughs> I don't know how they get around this, but again, it's just to pull authority and divinity away from Jesus, that they just say it into truth or so they think. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, is there any wiggle room there? Nope, not at all. Same thing with Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in no one else. We read this verse last week. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. The name of Jesus is everything. It's everything. So number five, false prophets and teachers don't believe that Jesus is the only way. And number six, false prophets and teachers don't believe in the inerrancy of scripture. Why? Because if you believed it, then you wouldn't be able to tweak it in a way that it suits whatever you want to believe. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Some scripture is God breathed, right? Okay, you're right, you're right. Most scripture is God breathed, right? Now, how much scripture is God breathed? All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. There's that good works thing again. Yes, so that we can live differently than the rest of the world in the way that Jesus has commanded us to do. And, and, and I've heard, I've, I've watched videos of Mormons explaining well, you know, sometimes Scripture is just too difficult for us to really understand. When, when they come up uh, against a rebuttal on something that they're saying, it's just too difficult for, for us really to understand. And then they just make up something else that's just completely different from what God's Word says. And see, we don't get to do that. God's Word is God's Word, and it can stand alone. So six ways to recognize false prophets and teachers. Number one, false prophets and teachers love to preach the prosperity gospel. Number two, false prophets and teachers do more talking and tickling of the ears than teaching and preaching of the word of God. Number three, false prophets and teachers refuse to call out sin. Number four, false prophets and teachers don't believe in hell or the need for repentance. Number five, False prophets and teachers don't believe Jesus is the only way. And number six, false prophets and teachers don't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. Now, again, we did this last week and we'll do it again this week. Here is the one million dollar question. If you're not catching anything from today except this right here. Here it is. Have you at one time or another, or are you presently hearing, reading, or believing what has been taught by false prophets or teachers? Because it's very possible. Because they are out there. They don't, they don't jump around, hey, 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 look at me. I'm a false prophet and teacher. They don't do that. What do they do? They're a wolf. And they skin a sheep and they put on sheep's clothing, and they act like a sheep, and they talk like a sheep, and they smell like a sheep, and they look just like a sheep, and they say a lot of Christianese things that are really close, and then they do one of these things amongst other things, and they throw you off, and they pull you away from truth. They pull you away from the true power in this, and that is, as we said, the name of Jesus. And if I tell you, if it doesn't always point back to Jesus, it's false. If it's ever taking anything away from Jesus, it's false. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 through 15, it says, For such people are false apostles, 
deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. Now, listen to this. They're saying, hey, these false prophets and teachers, man, they're, they're masquerading. They're putting on this mask, this false appearance, calling themselves workers of Christ, apostles of Christ. But listen to this. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. Uh, you mean he's not like red jumpsuit, pitchfork, horns, you know, fangs, like that all the time? Nope. That's fairy tale. What does Satan, you want to know what Satan looks like? Right here. And no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants also masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. Watch out. Watch out for false prophets, for they come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. They're looking to devour you, and they are out there. And I will close with this, and this is my one point from today, and we already covered it. We already read these verses. 2 Timothy 2.15. Do your best. Be diligent. Study, get in God's word in a way that you know, well, I don't know much scripture. Well, you better start now. You better get into this book because guess what? Wolves are out there. And I'm not trying to preach doom and gloom, no. But they will deceive you. Do your best to present yourselves to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Let's pray. God, I'm so thankful for your word. I'm so thankful that you warn us, that you say, watch out for these false prophets and teachers. And God, we've all heard it so many times, but God, help us to see how important it is to dig into your word. And not only to dig in to be able to recognize false teaching, but God, to be able to dig into it in a way that it changes our lives. That God, that it puts us on the right path, the path to love and peace and joy that you want so badly to give us. And, and God, we try to go through this life on our own power and our own wisdom and our own strength and we continue to fail and fall because we're not leaning upon your word. So God, help us to do that. Help us to see the importance of daily digging into your word so that we can be diligent, we can be approved workers, and we can rightly divide your word. God, thank you for those who are here this morning, who are watching this. God, I just pray that you would help us. Help us to know you more personally. And God, I just pray for those who don't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, that don't have a true relationship with you, have not repented or seen their sin in a different way and turn from it, to change their mind from it. God, I pray that they right now in this moment would say, Jesus, I give you my life. I believe that you hung on a cross and that you died for me to take away my sin. And I know without you, Jesus, being my Savior, I will spend eternity in hell with my sin. So Jesus, save me and change me from what I was before. Thank you, God, for your ultimate sacrifice. Thank you for the love that you show us every single day. Thank you, God, that you are who you are. And we pray all this in the awesome, in the most holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.